Hello, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, I'm going to take the next few minutes today to talk a little bit about some of the exciting research going on in our laboratory, and we're trying to understand ASD from a cognitive neuroscience perspective. And I'm going to try and get through three goals in my three minutes, and that is to convey our primary goal, talk a little bit about progress, and say something about the impact of what we think this could mean. Okay? So the primary goal in our laboratory, in this line of research, is to identify neural biomarkers of ASD. So what do I mean by that? Well, simply, we're looking for brain regions that show atypical or maybe a different kind of processing or functioning that we know is specifically associated with um, deficits or differences in ASD, okay? in terms of perceptual and cognitive processing. And these neurobiomarkers actually provide for us targets for neurointervention. And by that, I mean the ability to sort of monitor and quantify the effectiveness of treatment or intervention strategies we might be trying to do. They also provide targets for non-invasive brain stimulation, which we believe can actually help enhance or improve some per perceptual or cognitive functioning in some circumstances. So two very well characterized features of ASD are um, atypical or differences in language and social processing. Okay? Um, and so we're going to be focusing a lot on that. We're also focusing on a particular brain region, which I'm going to explain today, and it's called the posterior superior temporal sulcus. I'll refer to that as the PSTS. It's kind of up here, above, and behind your ear a little bit. And this particular brain region seems to be critically important in a number of perceptual and cognitive uh, functions that are particularly susceptible to differences in ASD. Okay. So progress. What have we done? I just want to quickly mention findings from two completely different studies that seem to be converging and showing differences in this same brain region. Okay. One, of that is, one of them is face processing, which is a social, a social process. Now we know that this PSTS region here that you see circled is critically important for understanding the dynamic aspects of faces. So that involves um, any kind of motion that signals social cues, um, subtle emotional cues, and language processing. In a typically developing brain, we expect that to be strongly right lateralized. So if we measure that with something like MRI, functional MRI, we can see that there's strong activation in the right PSTS, much lower activation in the left. This is an important part of specialization for face processing. When we look at, we see weak connections between these regions as well. When we looked at participants with ASD, we realized that not only do they show lower activity overall, but they don't show this asymmetry or difference across the hemispheres. And in fact, they show much stronger coupling or communication between these two regions and different sides of the brain. To, to us, this demonstrates that there is something different about the specialization of face processing there. In a completely different study, we looked at the ability to integrate audio and visual information, something we call multi-sensory integration. So we had stimuli that involved short movie clips of someone talking or telling a story, and those movie clips could either be synchronized, right, so the sound and the vision are matched up as they should be, or we could play the audio track a little ahead so the, the thing was out of sync, kind of like a badly loaded movie on YouTube, where the, video, the audio was coming before the visual. In typical, um, you know, typical brain development, we see a large increase in activity for the synchronous information, decreased activity for the asynchronous information. Okay? Um, that's a marker of multisensory integration. We found something very interesting in ASD where we found the complete opposite. So in that brain region, there's a decrease in activation when the information is synchronized, but an increase when it is asynchronous. We think this more basic perceptual level difference might give rise to downstream higher cognitive differences in things like language and social processing. So I'm over time, I'm almost done. The impact, what do I think this all means? Well, we're trying to develop um, neurointervention strategies. I want to tell you about two of those quickly. One is a non-invasive brain stimulation. Okay, so using things like transcranial magnetic stimulation, these are low magnetic fields on the scalp that can actually boost or alter brain activity on the cortical surface. Um, and we know that if you know where to stimulate the brain and how to do that, you can improve perception and cognition in some ways. We think this is a, a strategy with this biomarker. Finally, with interesting technology, um, these headsets nowadays can actually communicate very reliable information about brain activity, brain waves or electroencephalography, to your smartphone wirelessly. So we're working with a company that develops apps for your smartphone that can actually take these brain signals and give feedback to the person. So we're trying to develop some um, neural intervention strategies that way. So we're really excited about the, this way forward, and hopefully it sounds exciting to you. Hopefully I have an opportunity to speak with you about it a little later today. Thank you.